Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the SAFSI Food Dialogue. Uh, the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign emerged from the need to unite organizations, social movements, small scale farmers, fishers, farm workers, informal traders, and NGOs into a national platform to advance food sovereignty in South Africa. Since the launch of SAFSI in 2014, SAFSI has been advancing food sovereignty pathways and alternatives from below in communities, villages, in towns, and cities. As part of the 10th anniversary celebration of SAFSI, we'll be holding a series of monthly online dialogues, which, is, which will be focused on the next food system. Over the past nine years, SAFSI has undertaken a number of activities and campaigns to achieve the ends of advancing food sovereignty. We held a hunger tribunal with the South African Human Rights Commission in 2015. We held our drought speak out campaigns culminating in a bread march through the city of Johannesburg in 2016. We held our national food sovereignty festivals between 2016 and 2017. We developed a bottom-up adoption of the People's Food Sovereignty Act in 2018, which we took to parliament. Unfortunately, we were ignored. We took the People's Food Sovereignty Act to various government departments. We developed pathway and hub building methodology and a lot of grassroots tools, our water saving tool, our water, our seed sovereignty tool, our land sovereignty tool, our pathways building guides, all to end hunger in villages, in towns, and in cities. Currently, we have several experimental hubs at Vets University, at Stellenbosch, at the University of the Free State. We also developed the world's first climate justice charter in partnership with the Climate Justice Charter Movement and COPEC for several dialogues between 2019 and 2020. We formed the National Food Crisis Forum during the time of COVID in 2019 about supporting the food commons, food commons mapping, water commons mapping, as well as engagement with the government and the Solidarity Fund, as well as developing participatory action research and responses to the worsening hunger crisis. So this year, as we celebrate our 10th anniversary of the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign, we will be holding a series of these monthly online dialogues, all focused on the next food system. This particular dialogue will be focused on an important question, and that is, is the globalized industrial food system collapsing? We are fortunate today to have Professor Vishwat Sadgar, as well as Professor Jennifer Clare, Professor Jennifer Clegg is a Canadian Research Chair in Global Food Security and Sustainability, Professor in School of Environment, Resources and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Professor Clegg is currently a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems and a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the UN Food Systems Coordinating Hub. From 2019 to 2023, she was a member of the steering committee of the high-level panel of experts on food security and nutrition of the UN Committee on World Food Security and, World, and, and served as the vice chancellor of that body from 2021 up to 2023. Professor Klepp has published widely on the global governance uh, problems that arise at the intersection of the global economy, food security, and food systems and the natural environment. Her most recent pro projects have examined the political economy of financial sectors in the global food system, the politics of trade and food security, and corporate concentration in the global food system. We are also joined by Professor Veshwa Sadka, who is Professor of International Relations at the University of the Great Butters Rand. He is also the editor of the Democratic Marxism series and the principal investigator of the Emancipatory Future Studies in the Anthropocene Project and a democratic eco-socialist that we all know. It is also part of the Accelerator for Strategic Risk Assessment, which assesses the systemic risk facing the world and the future on a planetary scale. Professor Klepp is going to go first and give her input for about 15 to 20 minutes, followed by Professor Vishal Sadka. After that, we'll open up the webinar for discussion with the attendees. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Over to you.
Thank you so much, Charles. Um, that was a nice introduction and I'm really excited to talk about this topic of whether the global industrial food system is heading for collapse. Um, I'm just going to share a few slides. Um, hopefully this will work. Is that okay now you can see, you can see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Excellent. Hopefully it's not my notes and hopefully you're seeing the right screen. <laughs> okay. So um, as I said, thanks for this uh, great invitation and the prompt really, um, I find an exciting prompt uh, with the question of whether the system is collapsing because I have been working the last couple of years on a big project which is on the rise of corporate led industrial uh, agriculture. And in that project, I'm looking a bit more specifically at the um, reasons for corporate concentration in the agricultural input sector. And in doing this work, I really found myself um, diving into history. And I think it's really important for us to um, think historically when we're thinking about the next food system. And I know that's the theme of your of, of, of this year's seminar series. And I think that it, we can learn from the history of the emergence and spread of the globally industrial food system uh, because that spread of that system itself was a massive transformation of agriculture and food systems, uh, which transformed food systems from more of a activity of, of people and communities and commons towards industrial corporate activity. And this industrial agricultural system, it may have led to in increases of production and, and overproduction as we know, and, and it's also had massive consequences in terms of displacing people, damaging nature, creating unequal outcomes and undermining democratic participation in food systems. So if we wanna think about the next transformation away from this corporate industrial food system, it's important, important for us to understand where it came from how it spread and why it took such a strong hold uh, in the system. So, and, and that transformation to, to stress is of that industrial food system was a very long process. It took place over at least a century and I would argue perhaps almost two centuries. Um, so if you'll uh, allow me, I'll talk a little bit about history and then I'm gonna uh, pitch forward to talk about um, what we need to do to change the system. So I'm gonna focus my comments, my 15 to 20 minutes on uh, three big questions. Um, and these are all interconnected, um, but the first being what factors led to the rise of the corporate led industrial agriculture in the first place. Um, second, why has industrial agriculture remained so entrenched and with what consequences? And third, is the industrial uh, agricultural system heading for collapse? and what are the uh, policy implications. And if it's okay, I'm gonna focus more on the production system than the other parts of the food system, but I think there's similar processes and they're indeed all connected from production to trade to processing and retail. They're, they're all part of the global industrial food system, but my comments will be mostly on uh, the production system itself. So first, the first question, um, what factors led to the rise of the corporate-led industrial agriculture in the first place? And this process really began as early, at least since the early 1800s. And it really was the emergence of industrial produced inputs. In other words, farm machinery, uh, fertilized, like modern fertilizers, modified seeds and pesticides. It was the emergence of those inputs and the commodification of those inputs that really enabled the industrial form of agriculture that is so prevalent today. And as I said, it's a very long history going back a couple of hundred years. And it's important for us to understand the lessons uh, of that transformation. So I'll just say a little bit about these different inputs because I think it's an important history uh, for us to recall. Um, first, I wanna talk about a little bit about farm machinery. Um, so farm machinery or uh, farm equipment, really we're referring to um, here um, the mechanization of the reaping process with a, you know, the mechanical reaper that came around and was um, developed in the 1820s and 1830s, uh, as well as the steel tipped uh, plow 
um, brought to us by none other than John Deere uh, in 1834. Um, these kind of early um, modern equipment and machinery uh, was really important um, in terms of really changing the nature of agricultural production. First, I would say in North America, and then this um, use of this kind of equipment spread globally. And these tools, they were very novel at first because they were in a sense labor saving and um, used in, and produced with modern uh, industrial processes. And really by the 1850s, like between the 1830s and 1850s, the system had changed, the production of these inputs had changed so dramatically that they went from being produced um, in, you know, barns with, with uh, iron and, and foundry um, to basically being made in large industrial factories that took up, you know, huge square footages of, of these um, uh, big plants that were pumping out these kinds of uh, farm implements. And at first, these tools really took off because they served the, the U.S., so the North American context, where there was an abundance of land and a scarcity of labor. And so these machines were seen as really important in terms of increasing labor productivity on the farm and allowing huge excess production. But they also encouraged monocultural production, the production of the same crop uh, in the, you know, row after row within a field. And that really was like uh, changing the agricultural production um, norms along with that machinery. Um, and it also enabled uh, this excess production enabled export to Europe to feed growing urban populations, especially at a time of uh, urbanization and industrialization, especially in England. And so what we saw was this sort of rise of industrial agriculture was deeply tethered to the global industrial food trade. And it, that trade enabled and generated even more demand for this kind of production. And this uh, sector of farm equipment changed a couple of times. I mean, there was that massive transformation with the steel tip plows and the uh, mechanical reapers. But then in the early 1900s, we saw the development of gasoline powered tractors, which again changed the whole process. It went from being horse-drawn um, implements to being basically fossil fuel um, propelled uh, farm equipment. And this process of mechanization really led to a massive concentration of land because it encouraged farmers to farm bigger plots of land. And that led to a lot of displacement. It displaced indigenous peoples as settlers moved across North America. It displaced uh, black farmers uh, in the US uh, as well, um, especially after 1865. And, what's, and that concentration wasn't just of land, it was also of the companies. So by the early 1900s, there were just four firms that dominated the sector of farm machinery in the US. And one of those firms, um, was a product of a massive mega merger in 1902 that left one company with 85% of the tractor market. So it's sort of a rapid transformation really from the 1830s and 40s all the way up to the early 1900s when this, this sort of machinery changed the nature of farming and the entire farming system and the global trading system as well. But it wasn't just machinery. Um, that was that's important um, in terms of these industrial inputs. Uh, it was also the rise of a global um, fertilizer uh, trade and use on the farm because mechanization led to, as I said, agricultural expansion, and that also exacerbated soil depletion. And so by the mid 1800s, there was a huge concern about soil, uh, soil quality in Europe and in North America, especially. And there were new scientific understandings about soil fertility that emerged um, from Justus von Liebig's work in the 1840s that pointed to the need for nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium for plant successful plant growth. And these insights set off enormous change in the global economy. Um, it set off the, the great guano rush where, you know, the Chincha Islands of Peru suddenly were uh, being mined with uh, forced labor um, basically to produce uh, guano-based fertilizers. Um, these were exhausted within about 30 years. It set off um, a rush for nitrates from Chile to, to um, fill that need for nitrogen, which sparked a major war between Chile and Bolivia. 
Um, it led to the rise of the mining of phosphates and potash in different parts of the world. And these minerals are very geographically specific. And that was the nature of that sector early on from the 1840s up until the early 1900s. Um, and then there was this another technological change, which was the synthesis of nitrogen in the early 1900s, which was first successfully done um, by the major firm that we're familiar with today, BASF, um, which led to a massive increase in fertilizer production, use, and trade. And this um, basically set off fertilizer as a widely used uh, fix, let's say, uh, for soil depletion within an industrial model. So already that's two big inputs that are changing fundamentally transforming the food system. Uh, but also in the early 1900s, farmers were already producing uh, in monocultures, as I had mentioned, and you know, focusing especially in North America on wheat and maize. Um, and maize in particular became a site of um, interest in the US for improving plants and seeds. And this is where uh, you know, a huge amount of research went into the development of hybrid seeds. And a lot of that research was done um, by the U.S. government, but it was effectively handed over to um, a couple of companies that had um, specific advantages in the market. Um, and those companies basically dominated the hybrid seed sector, even as early as the 1930s. Um, but they were using seed germplasm that was taken from indigenous peoples that was being um, you know, used for that hybridization, but basically on the backs of others who had done all of the legwork. But it gave a few corporations a um, privileged place in the marketplace. And this hybridization became an important part of the industrial agricultural model, and which led to also other improvements such as the high yield variety of seeds again, controlled by just a few companies. And then just to complete the four inputs that, I, that, I've, um, that I'm talking about in terms of the dominant ones in the industrial system, there was also the rise of pesticides. And it's really interesting, the history of pesticides, because we tend to think of DDT and, and, and um, the development of, of that chemical in the 1930s and 40s, and then the rise of herbicides in the 1950s, which is definitely true. But there was a wide widespread sale of commercial pesticides beginning around the 1840s. And this again was an inter international market, um, which was um, selling pesticides based on natural materials like plant uh, extracts and, and other kinds of uh, naturally occurring um, substances like copper arsenate, uh, calcium arsenate, you know, things like this. Um, and they were definitely dangerous pesticides, but it was it was that development of DDT in the 19, late 1930s um, with the rise of organic chemistry that really transformed the market. And again, just a few companies were dominant in these sectors. And so this rise of all of these different inputs enabled this kind of new um, sort of production that really was locked in uh, in many ways. And I'll talk about that in a minute, about how these different um, inputs really were designed to work together to entrench an industrial form of agriculture. But first, I just want to say a little bit about some of the lessons from the initial rise, because I think these are important uh, for when we're thinking about the next food system. Um, but the point I wanted to make in this first part of, of my comments here is that the origins of the industrial model of agriculture stretch back um, to at least the early to middle part of the 1800s and laid the pathway for um, further changes that were later adopted. And we're seeing still today refinements to this very same model. We see it with genetic modification of seeds in the 1990s. We're seeing it with digital agriculture and gene editing today. Um, and some of the lessons from this early rise of industrial agriculture is that it was a, both a corporate and state-led process. So each of these inputs was uh, definitely driven by corporate interests, but also very much states were um, giving these corporations a helping hand, let's say. Um, it was also serving the needs of specific parts of the world. So it was serving the needs of the US uh, and Europe in particular. Um, and this production in North America for export to Europe was a very important dynamic in the rise of this industrial agricultural model. 
Um, it coincided with the rise of industrial capitalism, which allowed for this mass production and trade of these products. Um, and it had huge displacing tendencies and concentrating tendencies. So I already mentioned, you know, it, it was displacing uh, indigenous people, marginalized people from the land, and it was concentrating land holdings, uh, generating inequalities, and leading to the rise of just a few companies that were dominating these markets. So that's sort of that early history that I think is really important uh, that we need to understand. And in terms of why is this model remained so entrenched and what are and what and with what consequences, I think is a really important question because we all know there are huge consequences to this industrial model, but it hangs on. Um, and we need to understand why it hangs on so that we can understand how to dismantle it uh, for transformation to a better food system. So there are a couple, there are many reasons why it's hung on. And I just want to talk about a few of these um, briefly. Um, but basically, I would say that uh, corporate power and profits are a huge factor in um, this, the, the strength or the entrenchment of this industrial agricultural model. And I think this picture is funny. It's actually a real advertisement from John Deere from the early 1900s because they, they called the use of tractors power farming, but I think it's appropriate because those corporations that were dominating that market had enormous power. Um, they were basically erecting um, huge barriers to other firms entering the market, which reduced actually the diversity of innovations and narrowed choices for farmers. And so when farmers were utilizing these kinds of inputs, they had actually little choice. If they were gonna adopt the industrial model, they had to go with what was available. And that helped to entrench a certain model because there were so few firms dominating the market. And those big companies dominating the market really focused their innovations on those um, innovations that would bring them more profit. I mean, it was their business model. So they were serving their own interests rather than the public good. So even if there were costs, which there were huge costs, those costs were externalized by those firms because they could basically get away with it. And those firms also had enormous political power to shape policies in ways that benefited the expansion of the model. They were lobbying policymakers from very early on, even back to the 1850s and 60s, there's evidence in the US of the, you know, Cyrus McCormick, the inventor of the first mechanical uh, reaper, um, putting pressure on policymakers to pass policies that privileged his business model. So corporate power is extremely important, but it's not the only factor that was leading to this entrenchment. It was also um, technological lock-in. And as I said earlier, each of the inputs, these industrial inputs were designed to work uh, together as a package. And increasingly over time, there was um, that the design of each of these inputs was keeping in mind the other inputs and how that worked. So the picture I have here is corn. Um, this is hybrid corn uh, in a field. And as you can see, the corn um, ears of corn are exactly the same height. That is because those ears of corn were, were um, basically designed uh, through the hybridization process to mature at exactly the same time and to have that ear of corn at exactly the same height. That made it easier to harvest with machinery. And they also designed that corn to have really stiff stalks so that the, it wouldn't fall over when they applied fertilizer because it was basically the increased yields was because of higher fertilizer use and tighter planting, not because the seeds themselves were superior. Uh, but what this meant was that um, once a farmer had adopted this system, they had to make a complete conversion uh, over to industrial agriculture. It, it wasn't easy to adopt just a tractor or just hybrid seeds without the other parts of the package uh, because it created problems. And sticking with this corn example, um, that stiffer stalk meant that the ear of corn was so firmly uh, attached to the plant that you could no longer harvest it easily by hand. It had to be done by machine. And so it created this technological treadmill that was very hard for farmers to escape. Uh, and so that the technological aspect is really important, but those 
technological lock-ins were really supported by institutional policy and behavioral factors that deepened those lock-ins and created path dependencies. Um, there's something in the literature called increasing returns to adoption, which is that once farmers adopt, um, more, more and more farmers adopt a certain model, it becomes increasingly difficult to get off of that treadmill because they benefit from the fact that everyone else is doing it. So this helps to explain this entrenchment uh, of the model. And lastly, and I've already alluded to this, but states were really supportive of the expansion of this uh, model, not just in the countries adopting um, the industrial uh, package, but also through the export of that model through the um, Green Revolution. And that occurred in the 1940s, 50s, and you know, 60s, 70s, et cetera. Um, but also states initially encouraged the adoption, I would say in the US, it's really interesting, they passed you know, after having overproduction in the 1920s, they passed the Agricultural Adjustment Act in the 1930s, and that was designed to say to farmers, you can only grow on so many acres, but it encouraged those farmers to grow as much as they could on those acres. And that was why um, they initially moved into that um, industrial package or um, of inputs because they could increase their production on the less land. And this sort of created the lock-in that, that was then exported globally uh, around the world. And so we have this system that got put in place that is now, that's the basis of that system. And now it's being simply modified and adjusted um, in the current era. So um, the consequences as we know, and I'll just say briefly, you know, it, as I've already said, it's a globalization of that concentrated and displacing tendencies driving inequalities and marginalizing populations. Um, it led to surplus production in some parts of the world, coupled with rising food trade dependence and loss of self-sufficiency in other parts of the world. Uh, it undermined the ecological base of agriculture by harming soils, biodiversity loss, carbon emissions, pollution, et cetera, and created health threats because of exposure to toxins. So huge consequences, but the system has stayed in place. And it's been very difficult, and this is the challenge we're facing now. So now I'm going to get to the question, is the industrial uh, agricultural model heading for um, collapse, and what are the policy implications? And I've put this picture on the screen deliberately um, because it shows that we've, in a way, been here before where we thought the global industrial food system was going to collapse. This is a picture from the Dust Bowl in the U.S. in the 1930s um, when huge amounts of soil were um, basically um, being displaced through massive dust storms. Um, and everybody at the time was thinking this industrial agriculture thing isn't gonna work, uh, but it didn't collapse. It was modified and it became stronger. It was designed, you know, they designed different kinds of plows that didn't break up the soil into tiny particles. Um, there was an increased use of herbicides so that they didn't have to till the soil as much. And so there were, ways in which the corporate uh, actors that dominated the system could come up with new fixes to that industrial model that would increase their profits and enable that system to stay um, uh, viable. So in a way, um, you know, this what they did in the dust pool is kind of similar to what we're seeing today. There are now, again, with a climate emergency, industrial agriculture is trying to reinvent itself to present itself as the solution to the very problems that it generated. So now we're seeing this rise of digital agriculture, which is you know, promising to be more uh, climate smart and climate friendly, and the rise of gene editing, which is again, promising to bring us new kinds of biological fertilizers and also uh, designer, designer seeds that will be more uh, resilient to climate change. Um, and this was largely, I would say, the kind of message at the Food System Summit in 2021 um, was very corporate, as we know, corporations were, uh, had a priority seat at the table, and they basically had a platform to say, listen to us, we know what we're doing, we have the solution. This time it's digital agriculture, gene editing, carbon farming, uh, you know, et cetera. So this process then uh, has remained entrenched. Uh, because of those factors that I talked about, but is it going to collapse? I think th there's a risk that it won't collapse. The risk is that it's going to keep invent reinventing itself and using the corporate uh, dominance, using its power uh, to keep that system in place. So that's a huge challenge for the food sovereignty movement uh, and food justice movements more broadly. 
to push back against this uh, reinvention of industrial agriculture. So there's a couple of uh, big lessons and I'll conclude with these next three slides. Uh, but basically what's, what's needed is an uprooting of industrial agriculture uh, because corporate power is, uh, the corporate power promoting industrial agriculture is deeply entrenched um, and it's constantly repackaging itself as being new and transformative. Um, and those corporations have captured food systems governance that points to the need for serious, um, for states to seriously step up to challenge the power of these corporations um, as an important first step. Um, so it's, it's very essential that we tackle that corporate power and its deep roots uh, in order to uproot industrial agriculture as the norm. And that's obviously what of many of us are, are working towards. It's just hard to know what exactly those policies uh, need to be. But the a first step I would say is policies to curb uh, corporate influence in the policy process, and then to use the policy process to um, leverage change. So how do we leverage that change? I think what's necessary is to break the complex and interrelated lock-ins that are occurring uh, within the industrial global industrial food system. Um, I've been talking a lot about the field level because I'm talking about uh, production processes, industrial production, and those lock-ins need to be broken. But I've already mentioned this led to um, an international, like a national level specialization, and then a global level trade. And those lock-ins interrelate across the field level, the country level, and the global level, and we need to break those lock-ins all along the way. So there needs to be more support, for example, for agroecology, and the, but that needs to be combined with support towards greater self-sufficiency at the national level. And it needs to be combined with support to rein in the kind of um, global markets that are dominated by uh, global finance and global corporations. Um, and then I also would argue that the there's an important role, further role for the state. And I would say, you know, the state is the one lever that I think um, perhaps can play a big role. Um, and with many states right now questioning, starting to question neoliberalism, I think there might be an opening here. Um, but I think it's really important to promote a logic of diversity, um, to use state policies to harness um, technological and market factors in order to um, put in motion that logic of diversity. So what do, what do I mean here? I mean, basically, I think um, history tells us government played a huge role in shaping the rise of industrial agriculture in the first place. The state can also play a big role in helping to shape the direction of both uh, technological change and capital accumulation uh, going forward. In other words, we can have uh, better policy and legal frameworks to promote um, agricultural research and development. Like right now, almost all agricultural R&D, a huge chunk of it is, is private sector. And there needs to be a return to public sector R&D. The state can play a role in land distribution, redistribution policies to undo those concentrating and displacing tendencies that industrial agriculture brought us. And I think further research is necessary in this area. I mean, I'm just throwing out a few ideas that I think are important. Um, but I think we need to put some real effort into how we want to think about those levers uh, going forward to promote that logic of diversity, but it needs to be done with deliberate breaking of the lock-ins and also reining in uh, corporate uh, capture of food systems. And with that, I'll stop because I've been talking for too long, I'm sure, and say thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your for your for your input, and thank you so much for taking us through uh, the three steps: one, understanding uh, the factors that led to the corporate led food system, understanding the lock-ins that have entrenched that system and created this path dependencies, and of course, of how we we counter the reinvention of that industrial system, and now we break those particular lock-ins that have emerged. Thank you so much for your input. Our next speaker is Vishal Sadka. Uh, Vish, over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here on this platform, celebrating 10 years of the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign and 25 years of the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center. 
that's coordinated uh, this platform. Um, the question we're asking um, is very opposite for our times, and I'm going to come at it from a slightly different perspective than Jennifer, but I think the inputs will speak to each other. I'm going to share my screen also. Um, is it? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to draw on a project I'm working on currently um, around climate famines, and I'm actually going to use this platform uh, to test uh, some of the sort of concepts and ideas uh, that are actually going into a book that I'm busy working on. So the key themes that I'm going to be talking to are sort of the food regime crisis, um, and sort of situating that in the context of the poly crisis and trying to think the complexity of collapse. Uh, I then want to kind of look at the socio-ecological rifts of the globalized industrial food system and um, how that engenders what I call endogenous crisis. So crisis from within, uh, within the system. Uh, I then want to kind of look at um, a secular trend of global shocks on the globalized industrial food, uh, food regime. Uh, these shocks are becoming much more distinct. Uh, they're becoming uh, much more regular. Uh, and it's something that we really, really have to grapple with. And then I'm going to introduce the idea of asynchronous collapses of the globalized food system, and then speak to the idea of synchronous collapses of the globalized food system, and finally, just end with, you know, like Jennifer, you know, how do we how do we break with the lock in uh, regarding this globalized industrial food system? And how do we work towards re agrarianizing the world through food sovereignty? So here goes. So the food system crisis um, that exists cannot be separated from the larger poly crisis. There are different approaches to poly crisis. Um, it's been made popular by the World Economic Forum in a recent report of theirs. Um, economic historians like Adam Tooze have also kind of promulgated the idea. And in the main, a lot of this kind of thinking um, doesn't really look at the connection with capitalism. Uh, Tooze, for example, doesn't believe that we can really explain this. Uh, you know, these are just dynamics that are coming together and so on. Um, but I really think that um, where we need to go with this idea of polycrisis is we have to historicize it. Uh, there have been four great crises of capitalism or four polycrises from the late 19th century to World War I, uh, the interwar years and to World War II, the early 1970s and from the mid 2000s to the present. And each of these polycrisis moments has very specific dynamics uh, of socio-ecological reproduction, and he, each has to be studied and explained on its own terms. Today's polycrisis imbricates social and natural relations. There are interconnections, there's complexity, and there's contradictory tendencies within capitalism in this moment of crisis. It's a total crisis of socio-ecological reproduction. Uh, the fourth great crisis of capitalism. Women, labor, and natural relations at the heart of the current crises of socio-ecological reproduction. Uh, there's a gridlock of life making. And food system collapse is impacted by other polycrisis systemic dynamics, climate, resource peak, financialized inequality, biological disasters, uh, declining market democracies and its own endogenous crisis-making socio-ecological rifts. And I'm going to un unpack this uh, a bit more as we, we, we go down this road. So we're really dealing with complex collapse. Yes, there's triggers, there's feedbacks, there's interconnections, there's localized uh, impacts in some instances. In other instances, there's ramification at a global level. There's inside and outside the food regime crisis dynamics. So in other words, there's complex causality at work here. So the socio-ecological rifts of this global industrial food regime um, is something we really have to look at closely. All food systems need certain essential conditions for reproduction for them to work. 
They need geological, geoecological conditions to enable uh, crops to grow, etc. Um, they need water. They need nutrient-rich soil. They need labor. These are endogenous conditions. And industrial food systems, however, are premised on the conquest of nature and the exploitation of nature and labor. Now, Jennifer's uh, historicizing of the genealogy and emergence of this industrial food system help us understand uh, the kind of technologies that were put together to kind of um, increase these rifts and intensify exploitation of nature and labor. And this is the basis of ecological rifts. So let me give you some examples. So if you look at the geoecological rift, for example, Industrial food systems are responsible for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions and about 50% of food waste. And this in turn, of course, uh, generates um, emissions, heating, and climate extremes. So there's a feedback going on here. You can add other geoecological rifts like bee loss or biodiversity loss, loss and so on. Another example of a, a water rift is over extraction of water. Rivers and groundwater uh, on our planet, 70% uh, of global water is controlled by industrial food uh, regimes. And there's a serious water challenge in terms of over extraction of water resources, whether it's groundwater, including fossil um, groundwater systems or rivers, et cetera. A third example is the soil rift. Most countries have overexploited soils and chemical based industrial agriculture has undermined soils. So degradation rates are higher than rates of replenishing soil. And this is also a major, major rift uh, in the system, endogenously determined. And then of course, there's the labor rift. In most agricultural sectors across the world, farm workers are some of the most exploited and precarious. And it's also becoming a crucial driver of migration. So as rifts intensify, industrial food regimes um, generate endogenous crisis dynamics. So crisis comes from within the system. And there's two consequences. The first is endogenous crisis tendencies interconnect with polycrisis uh, dynamics to intensify shocks on the system. So what comes from within the system intersects with crises coming from outside the system. And the second is that it pushes the system into asynchronous and synchronous collapse. These collapses have begun. So just to situate some of the kind of shocks that we've been living through um, and to argue that this is now a secular trend. Uh, they're becoming more and more uh, frequent uh, and more and more distinctive. Uh, and uh, and basically part of lived experience. So since the 1980s, we've seen the remaking of uh, the food regime as a financialized and externalized food regime more deeply. Uh, it was there before, as Jennifer has pointed out, but there's something historically specific about how this has deepened. Uh, there's been new concentrations and global uh, a new global division of labor. And we are actually seeing the last great dispossession of the natural commons as this food system really tries to have a planetary reach. We've seen very real shocks, uh, 2006 to 2012, multi-dimensional shocks here. So for example, the switch to biofuels, uh, or in 2010, Russia uh, is hit by massive heat waves and has to kind of stop its wheat exports, et cetera. Uh, 2014 to 2016, an El Nino-induced drought, particularly in Southern Africa. Uh, 2018, a serious oil spike, uh, price spike. 2021 to 23, also uh, COVID-19, climate shocks uh, in various countries, et cetera, and of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But that invasion uh, came after, if you like, a massive shock on the food system, uh, and it just added to it. 2006 to 2012, we saw food riots, we saw the Arab Spring. Uh, 2014 to 2016, we saw 40 million people in food stress in Southern Africa. 2018, we saw hunger increase on the planet at a quantitative level. By 2022, the FAO declares greater hunger in the world. All gains that were supposedly made over the past decade or so have been reversed. I mean, there's big questions about the FAO's methodology and so on, but the point is, 
that global hunger has been increasing in the midst of all of this. So we are seeing more frequent shocks. Uh, it's impacting cereals. Uh, it's having very specific impacts on products. Uh, coffee prices have gone up because of uh, sh uh, climate shocks in Brazil. Olive oil has gone up uh, prices because of what's happened in Europe, etc. So asynchronous collapses of the globalized industrial food system they do not ramify through the global system, but are largely localized. So for example, and I'll give various examples here. Since 1970s, the British fisheries and fish stocks have consistently declined because of over a century of overfishing and so on, to the point of collapse. And many ocean fisheries are reaching a point of collapse at the moment. Lesotho is an example of a country that has destroyed its soils and is a net importer of food. This is happening to several countries. So this roster, this list of countries that have depleted soils is increasing. Saudi Arabia has used up its fossil groundwater, which is not replaceable for wheat production and has externalized its food economy through land grabs and food enclaves in Africa. Several countries are following this example as a response to global food shocks. In 2014 to 2019, the drought, one of the worst droughts that impacted South Africa led to the maize and livestock collapse in this country. In 2021, Southern Madagascar became the first um, region in the world to experience a climate induced famine. 400,000 people were impacted by this climate famine and over a million were in food stress. Local food production collapsed largely due to a drought. Of course, prior to this, that island and that region was pummeled by two big cyclones. And after 2021, well, there's been four more cyclones. So I'm gonna to shift to synchronous collapses of the globalized industrial food system. And this particular theme is, is really about a provocation to think about this a bit more. Uh, so if you look at this idea of uh, synchronous collapse of bread basket, here the literature is talking about key cereals, wheat, rice, corn, and soya beans. And this is largely concentrated and produced in a few countries that dominate global supply. Both endogenous socio-ecological rifts and external polycrisis dynamics are impacting these bread baskets. Um, whether it's um, Brazil uh, uh, for soybeans or whether it's um, South Africa for its wheat uh, uh, exports or any other uh, major country uh, and so on. Rice and climate change, um, I'm just gonna use this as an example. Already rice production in the world has been hit by heat waves droughts, floods, and planetary heating. And sea level rise is a big risk to all river delta rice planting areas in Asia, for example. Maize and climate change, again, maize production has already been hit by heat waves, droughts, floods, and planetary heating. Uh, in a study done by uh, Stanford University, uh, they provide a very interesting uh, rule of thumb. An increase of one degree Celsius essentially will drop crop yields by 17%. So as heating increases, um, essentially um, these kinds of cereal production yields will be declining and shrinking. The world is facing 1.5 degrees Celsius overshoot within the next decade. Southern Africa will be at three degrees Celsius because it's heating at twice the global average. Now, what does this mean in terms of crop yield loss? Based on the Stanford study, probably an over 50% loss in crop yields. So to continue this point about synchronous collapses of the globalized industrial food system, both endogenous socio-ecological rifts and external polycrisis dynamics are impacting the globalized industrial food system. I interpret and read the 2006-2012 shock as well as the 2020-23 shock as actually moments of collapse. And this is, this is something we can debate. It may not be collapsed from the standpoint of agrarian globalized capital, but it's definitely collapsed from the standpoint of those that need food. Um, and this was a synchronous collapse that ramified through the global food system. Uh, food prices spiked 
hunger escalated and social conflict came to the fore. In 2021-23, again, we saw a global shock um, with synchronous collapse. It ramified through the system. Food prices spiked, hunger escalated, and social conflict came to the fore. Where we stand right now is that world food prices have more than doubled over the last decade. So what do we do? And very similar to uh, Jennifer, we have to think about breaking with the lock-ins around this globalized industrial food system. We need to think about the re-agrarianization of the world um, to achieve food sovereignty. But what I've been arguing so far is that we need a polycrisis paradigm of understanding food systems collapse. We are not going to understand food systems collapse in isolation from the larger crises of capitalism. We also have to think in terms of collapse in the plural, so collapses. And in this case, in terms of the kind of conceptual uh, and, and work I'm doing, sort of asynchronous localized uh, collapse and impacts and synchronous globalized um, uh, collapse and impacts. Uh, ecological modernization, so more of the reinvention that Jennifer spoke about with gene editing and digital tech, et cetera, to bring us climate smart agriculture is really, a, as she said, a continuity of this old trajectory. It's incremental change and it's greenwash and it's a dead end. It is not going to, it's not going to take the food system beyond the poly crisis, beyond its endogenously determined uh, socio-ecological rifts and the crisis dynamics impacting it. The food system crisis is not a normal problem that can be solved by policymakers, agrarian capital, politicians, or food theorists. It has to be owned and led by people and workers. And we've got to think about re-agrarianizing the world through food sovereignty to address both the endogenous socio-ecological rifts and the external polycrisis dynamics. We need a triple just transition of the current industrial food system, small scale farmers and micro farmers and so on and subsistence and oceans uh, commons to food sovereignty systems. And that's centrally in the debate and in the discussions we are having in South Africa related to the People's Food Sovereignty Act of 2018, which we developed out of three food sovereignty festivals, uh, our campaigning during the drought and a people's parliament. Um, and we, we, we basically went to government, went to parliament, went to seven government ministries to say, let's start uh, developing the next food system, given that our current food system is in crisis and collapsing. This year, we'll be opening up further debate and we're launching it on this platform for the People's Food Sovereignty Act to be revisited. We welcome your comments. We welcome your inputs. Uh, we'll be closing this comment period by May this year. And we'll be revising the People's Food Sovereignty Act and we'll be taking it to Parliament again on October 16th, World Food Day, to demand the triple transition of the South African food system. The planetary clock, clock is against us, but we need transformative change to be driven from below now. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your input. Uh, thank you so much for taking us through the complexities of collapse and the causes behind it and the risks for the production, geoecological water, nutrient, and of course, labor. Thank you so much for your input. Uh, I think the two presentations complement one another quite well and they reinforce one another too. The webinar is now open for discussion. You can post in the chat. You can also raise your hand and you will be allowed to uh, make a comment or ask a question. So it's now open for all attendees to engage with uh, our wonderful panelists uh, for questions, for comments. You can post in the chat. You are also welcome to, to raise your, your hands. Uh, as, 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 as perhaps if I may, Jennifer and Vish, as we think about breaking the, breaking up the, the log ins that have been engendered by the corporate controlled food system, what do you both think will be the role of indigenous foods as well as uh, 
incorporating indigenous foods into bringing them into the mainstream after several years of being debased and sidelined sidelined by the industrial food system. And also, what would be the role of, of mainly rural women as we think about this process? Because small-scale farmers feed the world, and a large number of small-scale farmers are, are, are women indeed. So I'd just like to, to get to you both your, your comments on, on, on that. I don't know if Vishwas wants to start or if you want me to start, Charles. No, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, thanks. These are great, great questions. Um, I think that to start with indigenous foods, I, they have to be part of that logic of diversity uh, because the tendency of industrial agriculture is um, displacement and expansion and concentration. And what the product of that has been the rise of the four staple uh, crops that Bishwas mentioned, rice, wheat, maize, and soy which now comprise somewhere around two thirds of global diets. And the part of the reason for that is that displacement of the indigenous crops. And it's also part of that process as I was discussing about how the rise of that industrial production system is so wedded to the rise of the global trade in those grains. Um, those are the, those are the crops that the industrial system was designed to produce more and more of. Um, and for too long, governments have considered those crops, those staple grain crops to be um, a response to hunger. And they're, and they're simply not. Um, they are prone, as, as Fishwas uh, so eloquently said, they are prone to collapse, uh, especially when we have these synchronous um, crises at different parts of the world, which are becoming more and more prevalent with climate change. We're seeing multiple crises happening around the world that are that are threatening those four staple grains. And that's what's causing the perturbations on the, on the global markets. So indigenous foods are essential in terms of thinking about promoting food security, food sovereignty, um, agency within food systems, because these are traditional crops that are, um, they have specific um, uh, ecological, qualities to them that work in specific um, specific places. And we have to return to that specificity of place to have that logic of diversity. So I think that's really, really essential that um, there be this pushback against these, these dominant grains grown in industrial production um, systems. And I, I also appreciate your question about rural women and you're absolutely right. Like, you know, globally women have been so important in terms of being food producers. But again, the, the rise of the industrial system is very instructive going back to that history. We know, you know where mechanization and you know, these other inputs first emerged, uh, in particular in North America. Food being produced by uh, indigenous peoples was largely produced by women. It was a process that women controlled and women uh, directed uh, that production of, of maize in, in indigenous food systems. And it was completely displaced, completely um, confiscated and turned into an industrial activity uh, that was largely controlled by men. And that is something that, um, you know, needs to be pushed back against. I would say, um, you know, and we know there are many parts of the world where that complete conversion to the industrial model is not yet uh, complete, not yet, you know, fully, uh, uh, in place. And so there needs to be especially engagement with women to push back against this to prevent that uh, confiscation and, and that um, displacement. But it needs that conversation needs to happen all around the world, even in places where industrial agriculture reigns supreme. Um, we're increasingly seeing the big corporations now reaching out to women, saying that, you know, women can do this kind of industrial farming, but for generations, they were not part of the conversation. And so I think the gender question is super important. And I've, in my historical research, I have found so many um, interesting connections uh, along the way. I mean, even the seed companies that were advertising in the 1920s in their seed catalogs, they actually have pictures of women dressed up as indigenous people. And I'm not even sure they were indigenous people, but saying, you know, like our seeds are coming from these women. And by the way, this is, 
you know, these are the guys that developed your seeds. And it was just a picture of like 20 men. And, and so the, the gender contradictions were just screaming at you. And, and it's important for us to remember that history and think about it in terms of um, those gender relationships today. But also I'm saying too much, so I will stop there and let Vishwas speak. And I think Jennifer's covers most of it. I mean, I'll just say this, Charles. Um, yes, indigenous foods have to become uh, hegemonic as we try and make food sovereignty hegemonic. Um, to displace this mono-industrial diet that's making indigenous food traditions go extinct, food cultures go extinct, and so on. And we've seen this over the century and a half, okay? Um, I mean, if you look at millet, for example, uh, in our own context, uh, millet is an indigenous grain, and it's an indigenous food. Uh, it's drought-resistant in many ways. Um, and so this, again, is something that um, that needs to be brought to the fore as we place indigenous knowledge at the center of uh, food sovereignty, counter and, if you like, hegemony. I mean, women are custodians of knowledge. Um, they are custodians of tacit knowledge, um, experiential knowledge, etc. And we've learned, uh, at least in the food sovereignty campaign um, in South Africa, that women have knowledge about seed savings. Um, they have knowledge about um, how to propagate seeds, uh, because they're in the field, they're looking at these crops, uh, they're tasting, etc. So women's um, knowledge is key uh, to the whole process of advancing food sovereignty pathways uh, and, um, and ultimately uh, sort of mainstreaming food sovereignty and the transitions that we want. Uh, but I want to just respond to Faiz, and he's asked a question about examples and, you know, around communities, etc., well, you know, we've done a set of case studies, and I don't know if Charles can share, um, Charles, if you can share the link to the food sovereignty pathway building case studies we've done. Uh, in 2017, Faiz, uh, we took a decision not to build some monolithic movement, but to work from below in, in villages, communities, towns, and cities, and to build pathways uh, using a food sovereignty approach, agroecology, commoning, zero waste, uh, solidarity economy, and so on. And we have different processes unfolding in the country. Uh, many of those uh, community initiatives were tested during COVID. And the research report we done, uh, we've done shows how these communities have um, rallied around those food sovereignty processes to feed themselves during COVID. At my university, we have a food sovereignty center uh, we feed 1,000 students a day. Uh, we have several agroecology gardens. Prior to COVID, we had a very successful small-scale farmers market. The success of that uh, has meant we now have another big site where we're building a living seed bank that will network with communities uh, and we will be supporting more food gardens and so on. Finally, just on the international, um, in India, um, and I'm going to visit there soon, uh, there's a farmers movement um, of six million small scale farmers doing natural farming and li literally they're not using pesticides and fertilizers and so on in the uh, agro industrial model. Um, they are literally closing the, 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 the loop with um, biodiversity, uh, uh, sort of a biomass, etc. Agroecological practice, indigenous knowledge, uh, the role of women, all of that's coming together in this movement. Uh, when I go to India, I really want to uh, learn from this movement and what they've been doing um, around building the next food system. There's another international example um, in, 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 in the um, uh, Arctic area in Alaska. There's very powerful indigenous people's movements uh, that have raised the flag of food sovereignty, and they are bringing to the fore indigenous knowledge and indigenous practices and so on. I'm also aware, by the way, Jennifer, of a community in Canada, indigenous people's uh, community in Canada, but maybe you can say more. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Vishen, Jennifer. There's, there's another question in the chat from Sandra. Sandra is asking, what are your comments on the implications for the call for a return to agrarian systems in the midst of water scarcity and ownership uh, move towards 
privatization of water provision, and how do small scale food producers factor in future proofing of food production in the context of climate change? Uh, Fish and Jennifer, if you'd like to take that question. Okay, um, I'll go first then. Um, uh, so th that's from Thanks. Sandra. Thanks. Yeah. Sandra, uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, water in South Africa, as you know, 62% of our water allocation is to industrial scale farming. Um, it's controlled on plus minus 5,000 dams. And um, and that's a serious problem. It's a it's an ecological uh, challenge, a rift for us. Um, it's highly um, inefficient in the way they use water uh, on these farms. Uh, the kind of irrigation methods and systems that they used. Um, and we saw during the sort of day zero moment in Cape Town, how these farmers use their monopoly controlled over water to make a donation to the city of Cape Town and so on. So we really have to rethink the water commons and the water system in South Africa. It's absolutely essential. And uh, we really, really have to rethink how we govern this in a much more de democratic way uh, we have water legislation, and uh, it's currently up for reform and review. Um, and there's a lot of space in that for us to democratize the, the water uh, utilities we have, the water boards we have, the water catchment areas. Uh, our argument, both in the food campaign and the, and the climate justice charter movement, is that we've got to democratize the water commons. And there is already a legal architecture to do that. It's in that context that small scale farmers have to have a voice. They are absolutely essential. South Africa, as you know, has not addressed its um, historical legacies of land dispossession and, of course, the concentration of its industrial farming system. And that is a fundamental issue that we have to address. And the question is, um, how do we transition this industrial food system so that we deconcentrate it and address the legacies of dispossession and injustice, while at the same time engendering a whole new set of small scale farms? Now, there's some debate about, you know, um, small scale farms uh, engaged in agroecology and regenerative agriculture versus big uh, farms and so on. Uh, I lean towards the fact that small scale farmers um, are very, very important for the world we're going into and in the food systems we have to develop because we've got to embed food systems. We've got to localize food systems in communities, uh, urban and rural, in, in villages, in towns, in cities. So small farmers, micro scale farmers, they're absolutely essential uh, for the future uh, food system that we are building now and that we have to secure. Thanks. Thank you so much, Fish. I, I don't have a lot to add. Vish, Vish did a great job um, answering that question, but also just to say that, um, to re-emphasize that the industrial uh, production system and the global industrial food system more generally, the processing, um, and also the, ra the raising of, um, you know, large-scale animal operations, et cetera, all of those activities are huge uh, water consumers. And it, it it is not appropriate to just leave the consequence of that for smallholders to deal with. I think in addition to saying, and I totally agree with Vish, that small scale producers have to be part of the conversation in a, in a, in a more democratic um, decision-making structure about water use, um, but simply multi-stakeholder kinds of initiatives are not necessarily the right way to go about it. There needs to be privileged uh, voices of, of the small scale producers because that's those are the producers whose systems are not causing the damage and therefore they should have more uh, more of a say in those kind of settings about about water use. And I think but I think it's it's such a complicated issue because it spans not just even within the food system but the industrial um, you know, our industrial economy generally is overusing uh, the precious water resources that we have and contributing to climate change, which is causing more of this problem with water scarcity. It's all connected in this in the big poly crisis, as Bish um, told us in his presentation. And so it's 
I, I think we need to privilege the voices of the small scale producers and elevate those whose production systems we think are, you know, that we know are less damaging um, so that they have more of a say in, in how we address these challenges. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Before I, I, I take your hand, Keith, uh, maybe Jennifer would like to respond to a question from Michelle Blake. Uh, Michelle is asking that uh, limiting corporate influence in the policy process should be a first step in making space for lock-in breaking policy. So he's asking what measures and tactics have been ineffective in doing so and what have been proven ineffective. Right, and thanks to Mitchell for that question. That's the, the focus of the, the book that I, I've just um, completing at the moment, which is how, how do we address um, this corporate hold on, on the food system? And so there's a couple of uh, ways, I think, in which we need to um, move policy. One is to do this through competition policies, through antitrust policies um, that slow or prevent um, the consolidation and concentration in, in the food system and in the economy more generally. And the good news here is that there has been a revival of interest in strengthening competition policies in the past couple of, of years. Um, since the 1980s, there was really a weakening of those kind of policies globally in the US and Europe and in all parts of the world. There was a, a a sense that if corporations are getting bigger, but if they're bringing prices down, it's okay, we don't have to worry about it. Um, but that process has become you know, turbocharged to the extent that corporations are calling the shots politically uh, as well as economically. And so there's been um, rising interest in the US, there's been um, in Canada and the US, for example, they rewrote competition policies guidelines in December of 2023, so just a few months ago, to really strengthen um, the capacity of regulators to shut down those kind of corporate monopolies. And I think that's a really positive sign. And in both Canada and the US, there's been specific mention of needing to do this in the food system because there's growing concern that the corporations are profiteering, uh, especially off of crisis. I mean, I agree with um, Vish's comment earlier that we're seeing these mini collapses and they're not so many and they're they're dire for those people on, on the receiving end of them. But during the past couple of years, the corporations across all the input industries that I've been talking about have basically increased their profits by like multiple times. Like the fertilizer sector saw huge profit increases. The same with farm machinery, um, same with the seed and chemical companies. And this translates to other parts of the food system as well. The, um, the meat packing companies, the uh, food retail, the global grain traders, their profits have just soared uh, through crisis. And that's a real problem. And it's, it's motivated people like movements to, to complain about it, but it's also motivated governments to strengthen policies. And I think that's important, but it needs those kind of policies alone, I don't think are sufficient uh, to tackle that corporate uh, power. Um, there need to be stronger conflict of interest rules because corporations are funding all of the science that goes into uh, regulatory decisions. And that's bad. The corporations should not be allowed to have their own studies, which we know are biased because they're funding them, determining the research questions, you know, hiding the reports that don't have the results that they like to see. Um, and that's influencing regulatory decisions about, you know, what pesticides can be sprayed and what um, what kind of technologies like gene editing crops and biotech are allowed to be on the marketplace. And so we need to rein in that kind of corporate influence uh, and corporate um, or conflicts of interest uh, along the way. And those are just a couple of steps um, that I think are really important. But more broadly, I think movements can play a huge role in raising awareness of these problems. So I'm not, I don't know if you know about the, um, the, the huge concern about the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, in Rome having partnerships with big companies like Syngenta or CropLife International, which is uh, a global lobby group of, of um, the big, big ag, um, you know, seed and chemical companies. And the Pesticide Action Network, which has worked, you know, across globally with hundreds of civil society organizations around the world, um, 
really led a massive campaign to raise awareness about this. And, you know, it, it, it forced the FAO to respond. I mean, they didn't necessarily respond in a way that movements yet are, are happy with, but at least it put the issue on the map um, and people are paying attention to it. So there are, there are lots of strategies I think that need to happen. They need to happen at the state level. They need to happen uh, at the level of movements uh, to basically rein in this corporate power. Um, but I think that at the same time, we need to rein in the corporate power and takeover of the governance of food systems. It needs to be supplemented with alternatives that, you know, have been adequately studied and promoted, like the zero um, input kind of farming experiment going on in India that Vishwas uh, mentioned, and uh, greater the greater research efforts that are going on around agroecology, showing that it can really achieve the goals of reducing the climate impact while increasing production and availability uh, of food to people um, by increasing people's agency and participation within food systems. So we need that kind of research and alternative models at the same time that we're reining in the corporate, um, the corporate dominated uh, narrative. So anyway, I've said too much there, but I, I appreciate the question, thanks. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh... Keith, please unmute, you have the floor. Hi, Charles, thank you very much. And thank you to the uh, the great speakers, uh, really, really uh, interesting and uh, very interested in uh, somehow co collaborating with you. Uh, my name is Keith Roman and I am the CEO of the Zero Waste Association of South Africa. And we, in partnership with the Cape Agulhas municipality, are assisting the municipality to divert organic waste away from landfill. As you as you are aware, um, this organic waste, um, which constitutes 14, more, almost 50 percent of total waste generated, creates all kinds of um, environmental problems um, in landfills, both air pollution and under, underwater uh, contamination. Uh, and it's a it's a low hanging fruit for um, for uh, mitigating climate change, but um, we we are now uh, diverting the organic waste uh, from landfill to uh, compost facilities, which we've established, and we're creating lots of jobs through through that process. Um, but um, we have sold some of the good quality uh, organic compost. We in fact sent several waste pickers onto composting courses and um, and the and these waste pickers have now are, are now producing very good quality organic waste some of which we've already sold but we want to add value to that compost by um, utilizing them on uh, organic uh, vegetable farms and etc and so I, I'm not a I'm not a farmer and I would appreciate um, advice from uh, the panelists and others about how about who we could approach to assist us in setting up an appropriate um, farm uh, uh, provided the land is provided by the municipality on the material recovery facility but they're also making common age available next to the material recovery facility um, and we want to ensure that uh, we set it up properly, uh, that it's water-wise, et cetera. Uh, that's the one, one part that uh, we need assistance with. Uh, so we, I'd appreciate advice from you. But um, as, as you find um, in the food industry, um, the waste industry also has its corporate interests and there are many corporates that depend on waste uh, to generate their profits. And so uh, much of the resistance which is coming from uh, changing from the linear landfill uh, system to a more sustainable zero waste circular economy system is coming from those corporates dependent on, on waste. And these corporates have significant influence both at municipal level and at government levels. 
And so we need to have uh, a movement uh, from bottom up, bottom up uh, and, and, and top down. Um, so we are, we are affiliated with Gaia, with ground, uh, Groundwork and with Earth Life and various other international zero waste association institutions. Um, but we need a, a strong local movement. And so I'd like to chat to you guys more about how we can go about that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, we will we'll definitely like to check with you too. I mean, in April, our our the theme of our food dialogues will be on food sovereignty and, and waste, and we'll definitely love to to have you on the panel. Uh, Vish, do you do you also want to respond to Keith? Yeah, just just to welcome his gesture and his input, and um, yeah, Keith, we will be happy to talk to you and uh, and work with you. So please, um, uh, I mean, share your details with us. And uh, we'll we'll get in touch. Um, the one zero waste initiative we've been looking at closely is in the Durban informal food market, um, and Groundwork and a few other organisations, as you might know, have been involved with that. One of my yeah. students actually was on this call. She just finished a master's report on that. And but what's interesting about that is that you know the waste, organic waste, goes to the botanical gardens, and uh, well, it's used in the botanical gardens. It doesn't close the loop uh, in terms of uh, small scale farmers and producers in the Durban area. And I think that's possibly the next step, uh, because there's a large tonnage of organic waste that comes out of that 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 uh, the Durban uh, fresh produce market. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of um, working with you to sort of co-create and design uh, something around what you want to do, that's absolutely possible. Um, but we'll have to have a proper call. Uh, there's tools we've developed uh, on this, um, whether it's to set up cooperatives, whether it's to 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 set up, um, you know, just a food sovereignty pathway, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we can we can really sit down and and talk through uh, and design something with you uh, and provide support. But we, we we need your contact information. Thank you. I don't know where Charles is, but Keith, I could say something as well it, in case it's of interest. But in my historical research, um, there were similar kinds of systems of trying to capture wastes from urban areas and recycle them to rural areas to sort of close the loop because there was concern in the eight, mid 1800s that um, nutrients were being mined from the soil in the form of crops and they were being consumed in cities. But human waste was ending up, you know, flushed down the sewers and not returning to the soil where those crops were grown. Um, and so there were local, uh, you know, businesses that were trying to close that loop. Um, but that was all broken when this sort of scientific discovery that nitrogen, um, potassium and, and, and um, phosphorus could be artificially added to the soil. And that was really early. It was like the 1800s. And up to that point, there was the sense that that you needed humus in the soil to make it um, fertile. And this new research was like, no, 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 you just need these specific nutrients. And that gave rise you know, to 150 years of the fertilizer industry making artificial um, fertilizers. And we're now, you know, science is coming full circle now and recognizing that soil structure um, and humus is so important for soil quality and soil fertility that we need to you know bring that back so in a sense what you're trying to do i think you can make an effort here is to push back against the idea that simply adding nutrients to the soil uh return re, uh, restores its fertility you need that um, soil structure and humus in the soil um, and that's what the food waste composting can really provide so i think you have like a niche there and you can you know, open that door further because there's growing recognition right now that simply adding these, you know, synthetic nitrogen is not the fix. It's causing more problems. It's causing two to 3% of global greenhouse gases. Um, there's all kinds of runoff into lakes and rivers causing uh, algae blooms and et cetera. So I think um, we are coming uh, back to some of those ideas 
that prevailed in the early 1800s. And I think uh, it's important to move in that direction. So I'm excited uh, for what you're trying to do. Thank you so much, Vish and Jennifer. Uh, perhaps as a, as a last question from, uh, from me, what, what do you both foresee to be uh, the risks for, for food sovereignty with the emerging adoption and use of artificial intelligence systems uh, in food production in the entire uh, agro-system uh, agro networks? What do you foresee as the risks that are going to emerge from this adoption and use of artificial intelligence systems? And what do you think it means for the struggle for, so for food sovereignty? And also, what does it mean for countering the lock-ins as well as the reinvention or greenwashing of the agricultural system? I don't know who wants to start here, but I have something to say, Charlie. Okay, That's ahead, a it's a fantastic question. I think the rise of artificial intelligence and the digital agriculture, the data collection, the um, you know, the data number crunching in the cloud, you know, all of those kinds of developments that we're seeing right now are a huge threat to small scale producers and to food sovereignty uh, because these data are being collected by these big corporations. Uh, they're basically being monetized by these big corporations and they're being weaponized in a way against farmers because they, you know, they're connected now to these far carbon farming um, you know, where they're saying to farmers, you do these practices, we'll pay you carbon credits. And, but you, but in order to do that, you have to sign up to our digital system. And so it's sort of entrenching lock-in even more um, by turning it into this data analytic exercise. And for the corporations, it's like a huge profit boom for them because they know that their systems have problems. They've long had problems. There've been critiques of the agricultural, industrial agricultural system since its beginning. Um, and, and now this latest uh, kind of technology that they're putting forward in, in these digital platforms is portraying itself as the solution. And we talked about that as these sort of false solutions um, that the corporations are putting forward, but it's giving them inordinate power and we've seen this with the big tech companies more generally, that the, all the laws and rules that we have to rein in corporate power don't work with these digital platforms because they operate differently from normal market goods. Uh, they give the corporations extreme access to all kinds of data that is undermining just the sovereignty of farmers. It's de-skilling farmers. It's, it's removing them from the skills that they need to know to own, know their own land. Because the corporations know now intense details about not just one farmer's land, but thousands and hundreds of thousands of farmers land. And that gives them leverage um, over the farmers in, in that uh, system. So I think it's a, a huge problem. Um, but at the same time, I don't know how you turn back the clock and get rid of these kind of technologies. I know there's some interesting work out there about how to use the technologies in a way that supports uh, agroecology and food sovereignty, but I, it's not my specific area of research and I'd be curious to hear what Vishwas has to say about it. Um, but it's, I think it's certainly one of the major issues of our time that we have to really um, take care with. Thanks. I mean, Charles, for me, it's, it's the continuity and as Jennifer also said of um, the sort of conquest of nature and intensifying um, exploitation of nature and labor. That's what these technologies bring. Uh, they bring this kind of anthropocentric superiority. Um, and they attempt, as, as Jennifer says, um, to give these corporations instrumentarian power. Okay, so this is something that uh, somebody called Sushana Zuboff talks about uh, regarding these technologies. Uh, where they are able to use data points and they're able to use this kind of surveillance, et cetera, to literally control um, labor, labor processes, in this case, uh, food systems, and so on and so on. But I must say that there's a difference between computational, um, the computational realm and the real world. And this is where they're going to get it wrong because the real world actually is about 
complex socio-ecological systems, uh, particularly uh, on the ecological side, biodiversity and ecosystems that they are never going to, they're never going to get to. Uh, in terms of their computational understanding of the real world. There are limits to computational power. And this is where the small-scale farmer, uh, the indigenous person, um, the everyday human being who has a food garden in their backyard is going to be able to continue the path that we all want. Um, because in the end, that tacit knowledge that they have the experiential and phenomenological knowledge and experience that they have is not going to be in the hardware and in the software. Uh, it's going to be at the front lines of struggle to survive. And that is why I'm personally uh, very, very skeptical about these technologies. Um, and you know, I really think that we need to pull the brake on this digital juggernaut um, to ask deeper questions, ethical questions about design, uh, about how data is managed, computation. We have to ask questions about democratizing these technologies. Uh, we have to think through the precautionary issues around these technologies uh, and so on. Uh, but I have a volume coming out on this, Charles, called The Other Side of Digital Capitalism. Sorry, Charles. Do you? Hear me? I, I I I think uh, it's it's internet connections. I think I also dropped oh. off for a minute. I've just been launched, but uh, thank you so much for your thank you so much for your input. Uh, thank you so much to you, Vish, and thank you to Jennifer for making the time to for availing yourselves today. Uh, thank you so much to all the attendees. We are going to upload this webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, next month, we'll have another dialogue focused on our water commons. In April, we'll be focused on food sovereignty as well as zero waste. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much to our panelists. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for our attendees. Keep well. Thank you so much. Big thanks, Jennifer. Goodbye, thanks. everybody. Thanks. Nice. Thanks for the invitation. We'll be in thank touch. Thank you.